webinar. We are live now on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn also. So uh, it's a great pleasure to host the 43rd uh, Compassionate Caring webinar. The topic today is the spectrum of caregiving for a rare genetic disorder. So uh, as we all know that uh, rare diseases can be challenging, not only for the patients, but also for the caregivers. And the journey sometimes is quite arduous. And if the disease has been diagnosed at a very young age of say one year, then I believe the journey is even more uh, cumbersome. We would know, like to know everything about how uh, this disease can be navigated. And as a caregiver, what are the things that you should be doing? <clears throat> so before we move on to our uh, discussion, we'd just like to go on, uh, know, let you all know a bit about what Caregiver Sati does. And as has been the trend, this picture here probably says that, you know, you, you not only have to be one, you know, you, everybody can be a caregiver. Everybody in this uh, world is a caregiver in some way or the other. It can be the child at the bottom, it can be the aged persons, it can be the young girl who can be a caregiver right now, right here. An introduction to Caregiver Sati. We at Caregiver Sati, you know, aim to empower family caregivers by creating an ecosystem of well-being and healing for the primary caregiver. Family caregivers of those navigating terminal illnesses and chronic or any kind of unique challenges, as is the case for rare diseases also, we at Caregiver Sati try and help them in their journey and sometimes even beyond. How do we do this? We do have a certain ways uh, of going ahead. First of all, we have awareness programs. I'm so sorry, I'm a, I'm a little stuck with the presentation right now. So uh, awareness programs have been through uh, gentle warrior sessions that we have where we are talking about the caregivers. We also talk through uh, to doctors and are humanizing our healer conversations. And we also have these webinars, as you see. We have a dedicated helpline for people who are in distress. We have support groups, healing circles, as we call life and through loss sessions, where caregivers can find a shoulder to share their burden. We are also into research and we come out with emotional mastery handbooks uh, in our organization. And also social media is the biggest, uh, I should say, the way to communicate to the world. We are present on all the social media handles as of now to create more awareness. I'm so sorry, I had to stop sharing because um, there is a technical glitch. Um, I will start once again. Is my screen visible? Uh, uh, yes, yeah. thank you, thank you. Uh, I don't know whether if it's going for slideshow, it's creating a little bit of a problem. So I'll not go in for slideshow, um, if that's all right. So resources uh, built so far, um, what we have done till now is we are trying to leverage technology to reach out to our caregivers. Uh, we have support through app, uh, our dedicated app and through our website too. We are into training and you know, learning interventions, both online and offline. We create community sensitization through caregiver diaries, podcasts, our caregiver mantras, and daily communication to different channels. We also have started our caregiving coaching and helping families of caregivers by, by extending counseling. Our volunteer base is excellent and it is present throughout the world. And we have the privilege of training these uh, uh, volunteers in emotional first aid. Um, okay, so how can you get involved? You can get involved through conversations, be a part of our gentle warrior sessions and our caregiver diaries. We would like you all to circulate this, uh, our word 
and also volunteer in different projects that we have. You can also help us partner with NGOs, corporates, and be our ambassador. And of course, join us as an intern or fellow. You can join our healing circles or support groups help us raise funds. If you are from an educational institute, help us raise awareness among the youths. We do have grief research going on and you can help us by participating in the surveys. And last but not the least, if you are drawn to this cause and want to pay it forward, I would request you to become a caregiver Sathi through our certified programs. You can get all the details through our website www.caregiversati.co.in. Most of our work is based on the seven elements of well-being and the basics of these well-being stands on the physiological, physical and spiritual well-being. On the outer circle of it, we have the life purpose, legal, social and financial well-being. And, and finally, we have creative life and creative expression. Imbalance in all these elements could be to stress and unaddressed chronic stress leads to mental health stress. Resilience is a word that we have been listening a lot throughout the year and building resilience through practices of mind, body and soul is one of the aims that caregiver Sathi does. Today's webinar will be on three parts generally. It is the same for every webinar. We do have introduction and interaction session with the speaker. We encourage question and answers and we would request you to give our feedback also, some pre-webinar announcements. Please keep your microphone on mute at all times to minimize background sounds. Uh, if you have anything to say, and definitely we request for question and answers, please feel uh, free to ask them by unmuting yourself. If your camera is stable, you're sitting in a position, then great, put your camera on. If not, we would request you to turn off the camera. We are recording this session. Some sections of this discussion may be used for sharing later. The speaker session is going live on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn, and can be accessed asynchronously at any other time. In order to help us continue to make our webinars better, please provide us with the valuable feedback of yours. And it will be a quick questionnaire which you can fill in. This will help us design better programs further. And with that, I am delighted to welcome our speaker, Alpana Sharma. I am absolutely uh, you know, thrilled to have you on our uh, webinar. Alpana, I would like to give a bit of introduction about her. She's quite a qualified person herself. She's completed her MBA and MPhil and is a net qualified lecturer with Institute of Management Science. She is the director of patient advocacy with Cure SMA Foundation of India. And I believe that's her second baby. She has spearheaded uh, spinal muscular atrophy related activities in India with an aim to bring all the stakeholders for spinal muscular atrophy, that is government officials, insurance bodies, pharmaceuticals, healthcare professionals, parents, families, facing SMA on a single platform. She has worked extensively to create awareness on SMA and rare disease in India since 2014. She has present, represented Cure SMA India in various conferences like International Child Neurology Conference and in events such as Race for Seven Rare Disease Symposium. Alpara has presented Cure SMA India as a speaker on patient empowerment by Roche Pharmaceuticals. Alpana plays a vital role in expanding Cure SMA Foundation of India reach by partnering with other rare disease organizations like ORDI, IORD, PPHF, Indo-USA, Rare, various cancer associations, Hemophilia Federation of India, Thalassemia Association, and Sickle Cell Group. We have to connect for this uh, with you uh, separately. And uh, the the loveliest part is her eight-year-old son, Arav, who is SMA, receives a sole attention when he's around. And Arav has been the driving force behind Cure SMA India. With that, uh, welcome, Alpana. I'll stop sharing. And um, the, 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 the show is all yours now. I would request you to tell us a little about spinal muscular atrophy. What is it? Why is it a rare genetic disorder? And what is the statistics um, in India about this disease? Thank you. Thanks so much, Dushari, for such lovely introduction. And uh, thanks a lot to caregiver Sati, the entire team, for the opportunity to uh, come to this platform and talk about spinal muscular atrophy. 
so as dishari has already introduced me in so many words i really feel not as accomplished as she was saying because i think life is learning and you know we have a long way to go especially when it comes to rare diseases and something like spinal muscular atrophy uh, it's a lifetime you know it's it's going to be it's a disorder with which my son and many others have to live their entire life so uh, you know that's another thing we need to be prepared of so spinal muscular atrophy is a rare genetic disorder where what happens that due to lack of this gene called smn gene which produces a survival motor neuron protein which is important for functioning of all the muscles so what happens because of lack of this gene the children who are born with sma there is five type of sma which i'll explain later but children born with sma don't even get to live especially type 1 even 2 years because what happens they slowly all the muscle power goes on deteriorating it's a progressive disorder so you know the sma takes away their ability to walk to sit and even breathe to eat on their own we are lucky that you know we are living in a era where sma now has a treatment so that's the biggest hope that is there however it is also considered as number one genetic killer all over world yeah sma is the number one genetic killer because what happens that you know almost uh, as we go if we go by the statistics which is there in pubmed and different medical journals almost 80% of these children are born with sma type 1 and even before diagnosis you know we lose them thankfully because of all these treatment available now the awareness high, is higher so still we are getting to know but i would say you know Uh, as per again the medical data one in every 10000 live birth has sma so india would easily have more than 50000 live sma cases our our organization has 700 plus registered cases that's it so there's you know we have to go miles for the awareness and proper diagnosis right right and if you could now explain what are the different types of sma sma as you have said you know i i believe that spinal muscular atrophy comes in various stages so uh, if you could just uh, yeah. say about it so basically if you go normally what people know is there are three type of sma sma type 1 type 2 type 3 but there are as per medical journal there are five type of sma there's also something called sma 0 so okay. those babies uh they don't even get to you know probably before birth these are as i was telling you number one genetic killer many prenatal death that happen because of that and even if they arrive it's barely you know they are on ventilator and barely within a couple of months they are gone mm-hmm. so then there is sma type 1 with all these you know fundraisers and celebrity endorsement uh, now you know many of us are aware about this sma type 1 and we are getting to see all these that you know my child will not get to live the two years and before that the treatment is required so in type 1 what happens that the diagnosis is within a couple of months itself because the child is not even able to meet the bare minimum milestones like they are born with a floppy body syndrome and uh, hypo hypotonia is so severe that uh, you know with birth itself probably in a couple of months the muscle wasting starts they are not able to breathe properly they are not able to suck the milk properly so these are the symptoms for type 1 and the earlier the intervention not only the treatment but physical therapy and the medical uh, support that is there they, we can still you know save the child sma type 2 like in my son's case is diagnosed between 6 month to 18 month as per medical journal so what happens with type 2 is that they are, they may be able to you know achieve the sitting milestone but they are never able to stand on their own walk on their own so somewhere in our case it was in 10 months that we could see you know certain milestones that ara was not able to meet meet he was never able to kind of stand on his own or uh, cruise along the furniture now what happens that uh, you know i would say i'm still kind of blessed because i come from a family of doctors my sister is a gynecologist and my brother in law is a neonatologist so my brother in law the first one who saw this something was amiss with tarav and he told me that you know uh, get his certain checkups done it seems he is not meeting the milestone as you know it was first child in my uh, in my family like for me 
and my sister then she jokingly said that you know you get to see the all the sick patients day in and day out so probably you are thinking that he is sick but you know first birthday came and he was not, still not able to stand walk nothing and more than that the deterioration started muscle wasting started so muscle wasting is something you know the body starts getting thinner and then you know the diagnosis started with vitamin calcium and all these things these are the normal uh, uh, test that is that was told to us i am talking about you know 7 8 years back when sma was not at all known there was no treatment and awareness was very low but still you know uh, we got to know that all these test results came normal and then we were told to do the sma test that was the time when sma entered in my life and you know it was what can i say it i was shocked will be an understatement so coming back to you know type 3 though those are under difficult cases because what happens with type 3 the children are normal you know and these children are cognitively very bright very normal so type 3 is like it hits you at times in teenagers it can hit you up five years and above it can hit you at 10 years 12 years because you are not able to climb the stairs you are not muscle weakness is there condition is stable it is not life threatening but type 3 at least not as life threatening but life gets severely affected and eventually the person comes on wheelchair with type 4 what happens that the diagnosis is in 20s or 30s or even at times 40s because of you know muscle wasting and all these things now if we go by our data there are hardly 2 to 3 percent who is type 4 most of them are type 2 type 1 is highly 10 percent because type 1 don't get to live so what happens that you know type 2 are still somewhere they neither live nor die i would say the kind of quality of life that is there in india it is under battle altogether so these are the different types of sma the four right. or five different types yeah thank you uh, i um, i am aware of uh, spinal muscular atrophy and i am uh, i do kind of know what the uh, medical uh, costs are because of social media i would like to ask you alpana could you if you could just talk you know about the extent of medical support for spinal muscular atrophy in india and how does your foundation cure sma india come in here so what happens you know as i was telling you the biggest thing i would say ho- the hope that is there with sma is because of the treatment that is available so first part i would like to talk about the treatment aspect treatment is you know costly it's 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 expensive super expensive i would say you must have been you listening yeah. about the sky high price and the you know most expensive drug called zolgen sma and all these things people and parents have raised their funds few of the parents have even raised their funds so what can i say you know treatment is unaffordable to tell you very very frankly all the three there are three approved fda approved treatment first is zolgen sma th- second is risdiplam which is rosdra third is spinraza now one of the drug called risdiplam with the name ever has been launched in india by rosh pharmaceutical we are you know immensely grateful to rosh for that because what happens with uh, companies uh, pharmaceutical companies who develop the drug for these diseases rare diseases so called is that you know these are not generic medicine that you get uh, you can earn profit on first of all nobody wants to do research on so, these diseases and if they do research it has to be compensated because there has been so many failed molecules and india doesn't have any orphan drug policy in place and more than that for rare disease the scenario is grim so these companies tell us that you know your country doesn't have a uh, reimbursement mechanism in place so why should we launch such expensive treatment to india because when you launch treatment to india it has to come to an you know india specific price right and to tell you frankly my education was never in this field this is all the learning that we have gathered in the past 6 7 years doing advocacy i never thought you know that we'll be doing this but as it is a learning experience so we are still in that learning phase and we started advocating with the government as well as with the pharmaceuticals and this is how the you know cure sma india was formed Uh, i am grateful to my soul sisters for we are four or five mothers from different part of country who are you know kind of running this supported by the fathers so when it comes to you know 
children, parents can move heaven to earth. And this is what the driving force has been. There are so many fathers, there are so many mothers who are doing everything possible to save their child. So, and in this scenario, imagine the treatment. You get to know there is a treatment and you cannot afford because it's it's unaffordable. So when it comes to second drug, Rizdiplam, it has been launched to India and it has been launched with, with an India specific price, which is, which is, you know, cost varies from 20 lakh to 70 lakh per year. And it is for lifetime. The US cost is 2.5 CR. So even with Novartis drugs, Olgin SMA, when it comes to India, it will have to be at an India specific price. So we are trying and advocating with that. Then the government will intervene, you know, with government intervention, the prices can go further down. So this is where when we formed, it's a parent-led organization when we talk about Cure SMA. And it is formed with the aim to get all these stakeholders on what one platform, that is the pharmaceuticals, the government, the insurance, and most crucial are the patients or the caregivers, as well as the HCPs, the healthcare professionals. When all of them will come together on the platform that is, you know, common platform to RSM India, we can have a solution. Because otherwise, you know, I think being an uh, ambassador of caregiver Sati will relate to it that, you know, in this disease, we are all in a dark room, I, feeling isolated, feeling, you know, why me, why it has to happen to me and all these things. But when you realize that there are people out there, you know, to handhold, to support you, who are going through the same journey, you get that ray of hope. So with this aim, we are trying to, you know, do advocacy with the government to, you know, make these treatment affordable to intervene. And we have been uh, uh, successful in meeting even the health minister of our country, Mr. Mansukh Mandi, as well as one of the parents, along with their two SMA child has met Narendra Modi Ji recently. So that's what I was saying, you know, power of caregiver, power of parents, they are not going to let it go the moment they know. And coming back to cost, See, it's expensive. That's, you know, backbreaking. That's another problem why with such chronic illness, it becomes so depressing for the caregiver community because treatment cost is there. You know, you know, that's unaffordable. There's every, every day, every day physiotherapy that has to be done. These children need bracing. That is, you know, the spinal braces, the shoes, their care require a lot of cost. So, you know, if we would come to calculate, it can easily go to, depending on different city where you are li living. If I talk about Mumbai, the care, you know, for the child, you require at least 50,000 every month because you need to have, you know, a person, they go to school. So this, you cannot leave the child on a school. And the school, first of all, it's a bad, you know, challenge for a normal school to accept your child on wheelchair because they will have, you know, their kind of so many reservations and India is way behind when it comes to inclusion. So you need a dedicated attendant for your child. Then there's physiotherapy, there's, you know, orthosis, bracing, all those things. The nutrition aspect has to be taken care of. The constant, you know, meetings or uh, the consultation with the doctor, especially is that you require, and especially in SMA we require something called multidisciplinary approach because it doesn't involve just one organ. It starts involving all the organs. So you need to have all the specialists. And through Cure SMA, we have been successful in starting SMA clinic in almost seven cities and more are to be coming. So, and we are again, thankful to the compassionate doctors. They have, you know, kind of reduced the charges. Few of the SMA clinics have been almost free of cost to reduce the burden on the caregiver or on the, you know, taking care of their child. Right, right. Thank you. To those of you who do not know, uh, Zolgan SMA, SMA costs around 16 crores. Um, so that's true. What, what Alpana said that this backbreaking is so true. Uh, apart from the daily or the monthly costs that are uh, associated with this disorder also. Okay, so uh, I'd like to know uh, from you, Alpana, how does one cope uh, with, with the diagnosis of such a rare disease at such an early age? I mean, you got to know about RF at say, at about a year, 12 months. So uh, can, you, uh, can you just explain what the feeling is? And then since funding is a big thing for many rare diseases, I would say, not only uh, spinal muscular atrophy, it's, 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 uh, it's a concern for many rare diseases. Uh, how uh, is your organization 
you mentioned already that you're trying to reduce the costs through the government intervention, but what are the other things that you're trying to do? And uh, I know you're associated with other rare disease support groups, as, you, as we mentioned in your introduction too. How do you think caregivers should approach funding issues? Because that's in rare diseases, it's, it's a case of concern. Astronomical, you know, these charges are astronomical to say the least. Please see, so it is, uh, you know, that feeling of why me is is always there, and especially in the initial phase, as I was telling you, know, it's like you go into this dark room. It's a because the doctors tell you that you know it's a terminal illness. You can't do much to help your child. It's a progressive disorder. See, I come from family of doctors and still I had doctors who told me that have another child. Your child is, your son is not going to live for long. So don't waste your time, energy, money on this child. I have heard these harsh words as well, you know. Uh, and I won't say it's their fault because that is how they have also seen it's a vicious circle, I would say. Had I not gone to US and, you know, attended the Cure SMA US conference, probably I would also have remained in that dark room because initial phase is denial. You know, you don't want to ask, yeah. accept. There's also denial. Wherein, you know, you think, no, my child is smiling. He's cognitively bright. There might be some kind of deficiency and all these things. So then it goes to, you know, that, okay, this is what God wanted. Let it be. You know, many Many parents leave it at that and, you know, start thinking in, on those terms. And then there is why me, why my child, you know, and all these are societal norms because it's a genetic disease. So what happens in the genetic condition, both mother and father are carriers. So there's a lot of stigma that is attached around the disease. I remember, you know, I had met the, our health minister, Rajesh Topeji, uh, from, from in Mumbai, the Maharashtra health minister. So he was asking me, he didn't, you know, he was, he gave a very patient listening and our proposal is with him. And when I told him about stigma, he was surprised that why it is it stigma. That's when I told him it's a genetic disorder. So what happens that, you know, people around you tell you that you are the carrier of this defective gene. So it's your fault. And especially in Indian society, it comes on women that, you know, it's the mother's fault that your child is born with this condition. And then all these pitch legend up and those words comes in. So it further pushes you, pushes you into the depression. As, but as I was telling you, you know, my family stood rock solid with me. So I'm grateful for that, for my dad, for my sister, my brother. And that helped me a lot. And when I attended the conference, I saw SMA children who were so bright, you know, they were doctors, engineers, lawyers, CEOs of the company. And the quality, in US, the quality of life is different and treatment was still not there. Research was going on. But the doctors see, what happens, the doctors there have seen these children doing well. Today, if you meet a doctor, they'll immediately tell you treatment. At Cure SMA India, we have now created a, we have done, we would say, mama job. And I'm grateful to, again, all my, you know, volunteers, all the parents, patients, our state coordinators. We have 17 state coordinators, city coordinators. These are a lot parents of children and they you know we have kind of done awareness programs with all the hospitals doctors at least major hospital doctors in the country ongoing programs are going on with IAPs that is Indian Association of Pediatrics because pediatrician are the major first point of contact so and we have a SMA task force doctor which has topmost 30 clinicians then we have uh, you know collaborated with uh, organizations like AOCN that is Association of Child Neurology so today the awareness is much higher with the infrastructure that we have created. And the doctors tell you that there is there is a hope for your child. There is, you know, a drug that is there and all these things. But back then, when you see, and you know, I would say that this group has helped me and given me back a lot because I got to meet someone like, I would say, Sri Lakshmin Alam. Her son, Pratyush, is an, you know, IIT and he is now working with Microsoft. Uh, he's the one who has created our website, you know. Then there is uh, Momita, whose daughter, Debushmita, she's also from Kolkata, by the way. An adorable child, Archna, Razina. There's so many, you know, of us who have, and when you get to see, you know, older children who have done well, even in India 20 years back, you see that hope, you get that hope. So, 
and the resilience which you were talking about because you know it's not just you it's your child at the end of the day that you need to take care so by me won't help the sooner you get out of this the better it is and in terms of you know the funding aspect for rare disease we have uh, we do have you know collaborated with uh, crowdfunding platform like impact group because see the government intervention though we are appealing we are constantly meeting it will take time so by that time we have kind of you know tied up with different uh, fundraising platform with especially impact group because they have done the successful fundraising in case of many children tira kamat ayansh madan and many others you know ayansh gupta so uh, for surgery because even you know the, what happens final surgery is another thing that another expensive uh, intervention that these children require which can cause it's a life threatening surgery first of all you know scoliosis keeps on increasing and then you know it might cost 20 to 30 lakh again depending on the city where you are getting a child operated or the city you are living so these kind of costs we used to generate from internally from our group but all our you know parents are under immense financial burden themselves so now we are trying to you know pull certain resources from different agencies and trying to get the funding in place right thank you thank you that's that's quite uh, enlightening um tell us as a caregiver uh what is the importance of emotional wellness while caring for a rare disease child i would say See, it's difficult you know because till date i would say i'm surviving i'm navigating i can't say you know i have mastered the art because it's difficult as a mother you know these children are again cognitively very very bright and intelligent so that's you know another flip side i would say because you know they'll see children playing around they'll see children doing a lot of things around and they will ask you that you know why why can't i do this that times when ara wants to play cricket and again as i was telling very frankly that our society is not inclusive there will be few compassionate supportive soul who will try and you know kind of okay play one or two ball with you but mostly people try to no no you can't do this don't do it so it's so heartbreaking then he'll tell me why can't i do this mama why can't i participate in you know so many fancy dress competitions so many things in school the activities physical activities that happens so it is difficult but then being honest with yourself and being honest with your child is very important so what i did was you know i tried to channelize rs energy into things that now he enjoys we have had so many failed attempts like you know he tried doing painting singing you know so many things but he he basically now he likes coding so you know we channelize his energy he does these coding classes few math classes and you know chess and all these things so we are trying to channelize his energy into a positive direction and when you see your child enjoying smiling you get that hope and that is what helps us keep going and that is what is important for emotional well being of the both the whom you are caring and for the caregiver as well absolutely i just wanted to say that that if you see your child happy you bring in that your happiness shows on your face and that helps the, you know the family to go well also and you know it it isn't like if you are diagnosed with a rare disease it isn't the end of world i mean you should you should have That's that hope That's very important you know and today at least with SM and other things the hope is there now treatment is there so hope otherwise i remember you know so many of parents with older children will will vouch for this you know probably older than rav and all that this is what they were also told by the doctors that there's not much you can do go back and love and i i won't you know always uh, blame the doctors what happens the doctors if the doctors will see a dedicated parent of or now today the doctors are seeing these sma children who are so gifted if you google you know and you will see that there has been so many sma type 2 who has been toppers in 10th and 12th so and they are you know be they are can and trainer they they are singers book you know they are book authors and so many things they do exceptionally well in whatever field they choose so if that today the doctor sees these children who have done well they give that hope to the parents of the child as well right 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 true um uh, you already mentioned that you know this this is something that i think probably 
anywhere when you're when you're diagnosed with any kind of terminal illness or chronic illness and in cases of rare disease also there's this question is why me why have why do i have to face this what wrong did i do so um does any does at any point in your life this parent guilt comes in or and if if at all it is there because there's a stigma also uh with our society how um as a caregiver can we bring in some sense of positive feeling when the diagnosis seems so grim because it's a progressive disease as you say so yeah. how could we you know bring in a bit of positive feeling for both the caregiver as well as the patient so absolutely see the initial phase of my life was you know totally by me by my child i was so bogged down you know my life was going well i was working time to spend yeah and you know doing my job and all these things and you know preparing to join back uh, and all these and all of a sudden it hit you you know the first child is born he's healthy he's doing well and you then you get to know he's a rare illness so and then all of a sudden your so called relatives friends then you get to know the true color of people as well i would say because there's so many people who will turn their back and you know they'll start blaming you and you, you and i would say again the support group today we have cures in india which is a, and we have something called bedhadak bol the mental health initiative thanks to one of our parent who has lost a child with sma so today we have all these outlets but you know talking back to the time you know why me why my child it is it is it happens with everyone you know even the small problem when it comes to life don't we think that why it has to happen to me even if accident happen people say why and hey we are talking about a lifetime illness where your child you know will have to live like this you have to live like like this i would say you know it's better to accept being in denial doesn't help the longer you are in denial the worse the situation gets so the, so the first step is acceptance mm-hmm. the second step is you know finding a like minded people the community support plays crucial role and you know i would say hats off to caregiver sathi platforms like this i had not known had i known 7 years back that you know these platform exist it would have helped me a lot I remember meeting Mr. Prasanna Sirol from ORDI, and you know he was doing a lot of work at that time with ORDI, and that gave me a hope and idea as well. So connecting with other rare disease community, and today we are very well connected. But I would say, you know, you have to look outside for support. There is no harm in asking for support. There is there is absolutely nothing wrong. In fact, it makes you stronger. so that that has played a crucial role in our journey i would say right right thank you um yeah as you say as you talk about our world and talk about other uh, sma ch- children uh, you see that they are cognitively uh, quite uh, quite sh- i mean they shine a lot so uh, did you did you ever face this question that, uh, about the cognitive and creative and social development in children with sma yes yes are you know, they able I... to go to usual schools or you know what what are the different needs that are required or how much normalcy can be brought about for the child first of all i would say you know uh, what is normal today the normal has changed you know uh, so yeah. normal changes your normalcy cannot be my normal so first of all acceptance of that is very important i would say and that is lacking in our society so when it comes to school admission i was rejected by almost 17 schools because what happens the moment you see that a child has physical challenge is the preconceived notion that you know he has a mental illness and the principal the teacher everyone thinks the parent is in denial so maybe you know she doesn't want to accept she is kind of uh, trying to hide the fact the easiest part is they took test for arab and i would say you know they took hard, test which was higher harder so that you know purposefully to make him fail probably so that they can prove that you know he cannot be part of our school and all those things so the society is such you know acceptance is still not there inclusion is still but there are there are many schools that does accept yeah there is you know additional responsibility that comes on school and mostly on parents because you know your child is on wheelchair he cannot use washroom there's lot many things like their hand strength is very weak so lifting a book a pen a paper is also so attendant is mandatory they won't allow parents to be there because you know the development the so called developmental uh 
aspect of child is compromised and all those things so it is a battle i won't say the journey is easy but many parents have crossed this and what helps us you know uh, is that these children because once they start going to school once they start interacting and i would say you know, probably it's a god way of compensating if you look there's positivity in everything so they they're cognitively being brighter is also probably due to the fact that you know their mobility is restricted so their concentration is probably higher they will be more aware of their surrounding because they have to be you know there is the perseverance or is the sense of you know self preservation that they will be more sensitive that who is coming from this side who is coming from that side so they are more probably you know concentration is higher and that's why when you need to you know probably get a psychological analysis done and again you know this stigma that by psychological analysis but if you are able to cross that and if you are able to know that what my child is good at and utilize channelize your child's energy into those because a lot of these sm children are beautiful singers painters they are, they are lovely painters so that wow. helps a lot and you know i i can say you know, again i would say normal see something i have accepted that you know the so called normal standard of society is something that my child won't achieve and i i don't even want him to achieve now because that will be you know useless burden for him as well as for me i'm i'm a little as you say i'm a little intrigued to know how uh, a day in arav's life is or like how is it for him to go to school and what what help is required for him to you know continue with his uh, work could you just if if it's possible yeah, sure, sure. Uh, see you know his uh, it's very rigorous the routine he gets up at around 6:30 because his you know online school is also from 7:30 and the physical school was from 8:30 so he gets up at around 6:30 and the first thing is that you know after going to bathroom and all these we do his chest physiotherapy what happens with these children there's lot of you know um, pulmonary uh, care is very very important for them because cough coughing and all these things are you know with asthma type 1 and 2 it's it's very very problematic so now as a routine we have inculcated this where you know he does this uh, chest physiotherapy after nebulization we put some medicine he nebulizes he does his chest physiotherapy then you know kind of get ready uh, for the school and uh, he walks for 30 minutes in the morning like he wears his spinal braces and his shoes because he has started getting one of the drugs so there has been some positive development where he is able to walk with support so we try to you know kind of make him mobile he then has his breakfast and attends the school because it's from home so he attends the school on a standard uh, standing on the standing frame so that frame is again you know where he has to be caged because he has to wear all these orthoses spinal braces and shoes because you know physical deformity is very very easier for these children to develop so there's uh, the spinal uh, uh, angle increases where scoliosis becomes a problem to check that you need to make them wear braces and all these physiotherapy so schools is something that he used to enjoy immensely and he is looking forward to the physical school even though there were restrictions he couldn't participate but you know these children are extroverts so they find a way to include themselves and i guess the home environment also affects a lot so i would say the caregivers and you know being an ambassador on the people from caregiver sati you again you all are doing an amazing job because giving that positivity to your caregiver is very important that because they have to take care of that you know the child or the elder person whosoever requires that extra special need right. you have to constantly you know cater to them and that can happen only when your own cup is full so you cannot pour from an empty cup so uh, you know when he are at school uh post that he has he has to do his pyrometry which is again a pulmonary exercise and then he attends his coding class depending on his routine uh coding or qmas or abacus or you know whatever like he likes to play chess or other things he watches tv or listen to music and then in the evening again we have a you know online physiotherapy or at times physio session for one hour which include different exercises to again keep the alignment of his body in a you know better stage he does his homework watches some tv or till dad comes he tries and plays different you know games with him 
uh, he likes reading books and mm-hmm. you know he, uh, he has started reading modern history so other thing is that like any other normal children he has so many questions he has so many questions and you have to be constantly answering to them to all these questions so what what i have done is that my sister uh, the one who is doctor she has kids who are in 11th and 12th and both of them are you know, i would say a life saver now because they chat with our for an hour he will ask whatever he wants to with them and he takes all his medicines so that's the it's a part of daily routine that we have right right and i i so agree with the when you say with the fact that uh, you know the home environment is also important if you're like oh god he's got so much of difficulty he cannot do this then Absolutely. probably the child that impacts the child also Yeah, we yeah. tell all this to all our parents that you know please please don't have that even if you you know i remember time now i am in much better space but there were time when i would cry myself you know in sleep my pillows were drenched because there was so much of intensive physiotherapy that was happening on my child a 2 year old child being tossed around you know you know in that today i i do physiotherapy by myself you know you kind of become the physiotherapist because you need to gain that expertise but at initial stage it was difficult uh, but staying positive is the key uh, i don't think you know you should keep crying on in front of your child and especially with these children they are very uh, manipulative as well anyone is you know the moment you make them aware that oh he has he has certain limitations he will try to you know kind of leverage those things as well so so that's that's wonderfully said i i just want to share a very personal uh, story also while i have this discussion my my son uh, i do have a 15 month old also so um, my son has got hemangioma if you know hemangioma is basically um, a small protrusion of blood vessels which goes away with time at 5 years of age so it it does not require right. any medication but it is prominent and he's got it in his forehead and anybody and everybody who is to come and see my child is to ask the same question that what what is it has he hurt himself <laughs> so if i had have been oh no it's hemangioma it's like it's this is a blood vessel protrusion it's doctors have said so and if, if i'm like too you know uh, uh serious about this condition then the child will also uh, learn this the, uh, my mentor said this to me that you know never be it's like be casual about it if you're casual about it the child will also when whenever he is asked he'll be also said that you know this is just a, uh, a small protrusion will go away on its own so it is very important how we as caregivers react to a particular situation and see that situation if we are you know sad and morose all the time then that does not do any good for the uh, patient also love and strength to you and your son <laughs> as well and <laughs> that's when you, you you when you were saying about the normal see that's what you know i used to always say that until unless i treat my son normally i cannot expect the world to treat him normally so his class yes. teachers and what has happens at every class the class teacher would change so few class teachers would be concerned and you know does he require any extra attention or extra thing i would tell them strictly no whatever he needs attendant is there and treat him like any other average your school student that's yeah. what he can do uh, because the moment you give him extra time to write you know thinking that his hand strength is affected he might try to take advantage of this so. right 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 so well said yeah okay um so um I, you already mentioned this I, I, before i ask questions i'm getting a lot to know from you alpana that you already are a physiotherapist now yourself because this has been this physical therapy has been going on for such a long time so as a a, a caregiver for a rare disease like spinal muscular atrophy uh, the caregiver might have to take on more tasks and learn new skills now how to what what is your suggestion on this and uh, it also makes the caregiver more indispensable right so um how how do you go about with it um, see uh, there is you know there are a lot of aspect into this now what happens that uh, you keep an attendant with your child you can you know you can teach the attendant certain things but uh, the amount of care that you know a mother or a father or who sir the primary caregiver can give i don't think anyone else can and uh, the topic uh, of your webinar also compassionate caring i liked it very very much because you know that that's the word compassion it's so very important be the physiotherapist the certified physiotherapist whom you are you know kind of associating with 
or any other person compassion is very important and i have been blessed in terms of you know i have had fabulous support from the physiotherapist the rs physiotherapist have been exceptionally compassionate in terms of you know they are they became at one point of time more of my family and relative than my actual friends and relatives because you get to meet them every day and rs used to have you know these therapists twice a day these initially you know a trained physiotherapist would come twice a day and they taught me and you know the more time you spend the more time you you are with your child and the therapist there are certain things that you get to learn and many of the certified qualified physiotherapist have told that the mother is the best physiotherapist because see what happens with these critical condition crit, uh, you know chronic illness uh, that one hour physiotherapy won't help it, you know if 23 hours you are not keeping the child in a proper alignment or in a proper way that 45 minute or 1 hour of therapy won't help because there is certain deficiency in the body which which is you know which has set it against and it's progressing so that kind of awareness and support from physiotherapist helped me a lot uh, in terms of you know changing my lifestyle changing our lifestyle around it and if you see behind me there is you know this parallel bar and his entire room has been changed into now a kind of you know play or physio area a uh, second thing is very important you know the physiotherapy is no longer for our it's kind of you know burden we do it more of a playfully all his physiotherapist have been again very helpful they it's more of play you know playfully and he calls them dd or you know all these things because uh, the moment it's not something you know ki ab karwaye ja rahe hain trained exercise and all these things you have to engage a child it's it's an active exercise it's not a passive exercise the muscles in the body has to work you have to engage the child so you have to constantly find ways to make it you know a good fun activity as well as increasing the core muscles and all these things so the certified therapist has helped me a lot in gaining all these skills and we are still in that learning phase and yes when you say it does makes you know the caregiver indispensable but that's a choice that's a conscious decision that you know one has to make uh, like in my case my career you know my career has taken a back seat from being a full time worker to have become a part time you know uh, guest lecturer uh, taking you know when whenever i have free time i take lectures more from the economic or the money monetary aspect my primary focus is my child but i would say it's a choice that you are making you know it's a decision that you have to make and it has to come from within you because you cannot you know then guilt trip your child your husband or people around you that you know, that, that why i made that choice and i see my child doing well when i see him smile you know i have a mental peace and that's what helps right 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 and uh, do you find uh, uh, any help with in advancement of technology what are the advancements or apps or gadgets that can help the patient and ease some tasks uh, for the caregiver you think uh, is there a anything? lot uh, in india we are still way behind but when we when i see international support system there are robots that you know there are sma type 2 moms who have children and there's a robot assistant who is you know feeding the child Uh, oh, wow. the milk bottle as well as feeding the mom now i can't say the same in india but yeah self driven you know the the self driven cars when it comes to india can be very very helpful not only with patient with sma any wheelchair bound person you know that entire disabled community apps like swiggy or zomato where you have these uh, you know swiggy genie where you can get the groceries delivered at your home right. now imagine the infrastructure that india has there is no wheelchair accessibility i have this thing that you know once i grow old and we cannot you know the help or the attendant comes and goes you cannot have a attendant for lifetime but your child has this disease your body is also going to after a certain point of time we are going to get old and then you know we'll take care of your dependent child and all so these technological advancement today in terms of swiggy is a matter i, I was the online you know the food or restaurant but from the aspect that grocery delivery and the pandemic has been a life saving for us you know like they say there's a dark uh there's a silver lining in every dark cloud so the pandemic has kind of brought lot of because everyone has become home bound so you know what my child or arav was facing bound in a wheelchair now today everyone is facing when that so there has been a lot of these things where online meetings are there lot of work opportunities there which is through online and 
these things. So these these have been helpful, and I would say, let's hope that you know India gets to a place where all the gadgets, which are important and you know kind of assistive technologies, comes to India. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yes, we are almost um, to the end of this uh, webinar. I would like you, since you've been doing this from twenty fourteen. And you have also, uh, you know, associated yourself with other rare disease support groups too. Any tips or learnings from your experience that really helped you and you would share with other caregivers, you know, who have tuned in or you will be tuning into this conversation? Uh, any ways to de-stress yourself? Any ways that, you know, uh, as a caregiver for a rare disease, you could share with us? Any tips? Yeah. So first is acceptance. Acceptance helps a lot, you know. Um, the sooner, again, I, as I said, the sooner you accept, the better it is that this is what the child is going to have, this is what the condition is. The second is finding support in your, you know, in your people around you, be it online community, be it physical, right, from your family, not everyone in family can be supportive, then finding a friends. And communities like caregiver Sati, you know, your community as well, that helps a very, very pivotal role in this. Because, you know, every day, day in and day out, you have to live with disease. You have to make peace with the situation. So when you listen, when you, you know, you get to talk to other brothers who have, you know, lived with this condition, who are still um, battling this, other rare disease parents who, you know, where I would say SMA at least has a hope today. Now there are three treatments. There are many rare diseases which are untreatable. Imagine, you know, I would say like probably for any other normal parent, my condition, similarly, imagine a condition where the child is not even able to speak. Now, how would you know, you know, there are different rare diseases or condition where there's intellectual disability. The child is not even able to speak that he is feeling thirsty or, you know, he needs to eat. What kind of, you know, trauma that the parents, the caregiver goes around him. You need to find a routine through that. And then, you know, these for these stressing yourself, either read book, talk to a friend, you know, family or listen to music, listen to, you know, motivational talks and all these things. That helps a lot. Because as I said, initially, you cannot pour, pour from an empty uh, cup. So you need to fill right. your own cup for that. Right. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, um, Alpana, for sharing your journey um, as a caregiver uh, with us. So we um, did have some questions. You know, we uh, opened registrations and we have a few questions. I would also request our guests present here, people watching through Facebook, YouTube also, if you have any questions, please uh, put it forward for us and we can take it up. Uh, uh, we did have a question which says that, you know, how does one connect uh, to other caregivers within or outside India when an incidence of rare disease, you know, occurs, uh, when the condition is rare? How I, 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 before you go into this uh, uh, answer, I would just like to mention that Caregiver Sati is also trying to bring in some support groups for renal disease, for Alzheimer's, for mental health uh, also. Uh, and of course, we have Alpana here with rare disease. So if you could just uh, explain a little bit on this. So see, today social media is, uh, thankfully, we are in the era where social media is there. The moment you, you know, type in Google that uh, rare disease or SMA, you will get uh, various organizations and all these organizations have their helpline number. They have their, you know, uh, websites and uh, Facebook. Like in our case, we are, we are two, three admins in Facebook. group. We have our helpline number and we have our, you know, the uh, registration number and all these things. So there are various ways you can reach out or connect with the group. And uh, this is how, you know, once you connect, then in every city, as I was talking, we have a city uh, coordinator where the volunteers, few volunteers are also there and they help you through the initial phase of that uh, darkness or, you know, getting right. out of this. Right, right. Um, how expensive are uh, genetic testing in India was a question that came up from a, a participant. So, um, it is, uh, see, uh, like from, you know, I would say middle class can still afford it is depending mm. on the what test you are taking it 6K to 7K. Mm. You know, at times 10,000 as well, again, depending on the city. 
uh, it varies from range can be 4,000 to 10,000 depending because there are different tests uh, for SMA it is seven to 8,000 then there's carrier testing there are different if you are going for prenatal testing or CBS that's different you know so the uh, solution can be you know that if the government can make it mandatory for the genetic yeah. testing and if it can be affordable because there is you know, association like IGB, which does free of cost testing. We have, you know, if you okay. go to your SMA, yes, I, yes, we have tied up for the free genetic testing as well. But it takes time for the IGB because the sample will be collected and, you know, the testing report to come will take time. So we are trying to, you know, make it the uh, testing aspect also affordable. But again, as I was saying, you know, we all are tax paying citizens. So I think it's high time the government takes the ownership. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, I would like um, other people, the forum is open. If there's any question that you have to ask, uh, we would like you to do it now. Um, uh, you can also type in your questions uh, in the chat box and we'll be happy to take it up. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, when uh, others are, uh, you know, thinking of their questions, um, I'd like to, to like you to talk about other, um, you know, rare diseases uh, and what is the importance of, you know, having a support group? Do you think that um, not only for rare disease, Alpana, I would like to know a support group for any kind of disease, is that is that feasible? Do you think it is important? Yes, it is. It is, you know, a support group plays a very, very important role. And uh, uh, especially in case of, case of rare disease, because it affects the minuscule population. Mm -hmm. So uh, you get to have, if you get to know that there are, you know, people in the same situation, there are like-minded people, it can be life altering. So uh, support group is very, very important. You know, I cannot, uh, today I cannot imagine my life without uh, our foundation. And I think as a caregiver, Sati, you can also you have been supporting so many disease areas, so many, you know, conditions and people. So th this, you know, even your family, what happens that even your brother, sister, whosoever you are blood relative, and yeah. they cannot totally associate with you because they are not living your life. So it is, if you get to meet someone who is exa exactly in your same shoes and living your life, they can guide and mentor you in like, in a very, very, very professional way. Right. I also have a, a question uh, that uh, is there any assistance that is available for rare uh, diseases um, in the sense that you already talked about uh, crowdfunding like Impact Guru and we have heard about Keto and stuff, but are there any other ways through which uh, some kind of assistance for rare disease funding is uh, available? So government has formed this policy, rare disease policy. Sorry, I had to, you know, switch. there were some uh, network issues, so I had it's to right. uh, switch off right. the camera. So the government has formed this uh, rare disease policy, but uh, I would say, you know, and they are coming up with some funding possibility, and there is something called Niramya scheme, which uh, covers for one and one and a half lakh, lakh uh, of cost uh, for every year. Uh, however, this is not sufficient. And the government uh, front, the rare disease policy that is there, you have need to register with the center of excellence. There are eight center of excellence where, you know, a person suffering from rare disease can go and register. And the government uh, 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 will try to create funding opportunity. However, you know, it's a very, very, uh, I would say, unstructured approach because the funding aspect has not been taken care of in this matter. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, any questions um, from the guests here? Um, if not, then I will go ahead and um, close our uh, uh, conversation. Alpana, would you like to uh, share uh, any email ID where people, if required, can contact you? Um, so Yes, yes. Uh, people can contact me on my ID, Alpana Sharma at the rate curesma India dot org, and we have another email ID, info at the rate curesma India dot org. So they can go to our website, the email IDs and our team, and many other. There is a direct helpline number, the WhatsApp number is there, the contact number, landline number is there. So all these, uh, you know, if you go to the website www.curesma India dot org. 
you will get all the numbers and the details information there wonderful wonderful thank you so much for sharing your insights and i believe people who are navigating rare diseases in their families could find hope and of course more information through your site and your work too so thank you for you know uh, enlightening thanks. our thanks webinar thanks a lot thanks so much for this wonderful opportunity it was very lovely interacting with you and thanks a lot caregiver sathi for this opportunity thank you thank you thank you so much and with thanks. this i would yeah i would stop live uh, recording